the British troops were trapped inside Singapore City. The Japanese had left them without water or supplies, and after 70 days of intense persecution across the Malayan Peninsula, the defenders were exhausted. Lieutenant General Arthur Percival was at a crossroads. Although Prime Minister Winston Churchill had mandated that the colony be defended to the last man, Percival's forces were overwhelmed, and the commander had to avoid further losses. Forced to capitulate, Percival met with Japanese leader Lieutenant General Tomoyuki Yamashita. The invaders asked for unconditional surrender, but Percival demanded better conditions for his soldiers. Yamashita was furious and smashed his fist on the table. His conditions were non-negotiable, as he couldn't risk letting the British know about a secret that could turn the odds in their favor. The Gate to Asia Singapore was considered Britain's Gibraltar in the Far East and was regarded as valuable as that location in Europe. The strategic island was, and remains, the gateway into Asia. Control of Singapore meant control of a vast proportion of the Far East. Throughout the 1930s and early 1940s, the British and the region maintained an atmosphere of colonial sociability, while the military forces stationed on the island epitomized the British ideal of gentlemanship through their distinguished officers. Still, in the hot jungles of the Southeast Asian colony, the threat of a Japanese invasion was ever-present. However, fear was mitigated by the notion that Singapore was a formidable and impregnable fortress. Moreover, the blind fate of the British in their own military strength caused an air of what could be described as lethargy among the troops and officers. The British did expect an attack, but they considered victory an undoubted conclusion. Despite the generalized arrogance from the British politicians in 1936, then General Officer Commanding Malaya, Major General William Dobby, inquired whether a bulkier garrison was needed on the mainland to prevent the Japanese from attacking Singapore from land. His chief staff officer, Arthur Ernest Percival, drew up a tactical assessment of the most likely invasion strategy. Percival's written appreciation identified the beaches on which the Japanese would probably land, as well as the axes through which they would advance in the Malayan Peninsula. His analysis also confirmed the grim suspicions that North Malaya would likely become the critical battleground. A Sentry Box In the spring of 1941, Lieutenant General Arthur Ernest Percival was appointed General Officer Commanding Malaya. Now his earlier predictions were the basis for a defensive plan. But much to his concern, he found that both the country and the military were in a state of alarming unpreparedness. Ironically, the naval base in Singapore, the same vital position that justified defending the region, was devoid of a creditable maritime force. Some described the stronghold as, quote, a sentry box without a sentry. Likewise, the Royal Air Force had appealed for a considerable increase in frontline aircraft. As Percival instructed, the strategy implied the destruction of the invading force at sea before a landing could even unfold. Even so, London merely committed 336 aircraft instead of the requested 566, and not all of them showed up, leaving an obsolete fleet of 158 aircraft on station by December of 1941. Meanwhile, the Army had a severe shortage of manpower, even more so considering the vast area to be defended. In fact, there were efforts to increase the size of the garrison, but the reinforcements were young Indian recruits, some only 17 years old and barely out of training. Moreover, there were no armored units and a pitiful amount of artillery pieces. Aware of the deficiencies, Prime Minister Winston Churchill made the decision to focus on the defense of mainland Britain. And it wasn't just the nation's security that was at stake, but also its honor. Surprise attack. The Japanese ambitions in the Pacific were painfully obvious, as they needed to hoard the rich mineral resources of Southeast Asia. By mid-1941, they had expanded their territories as far as Hainan, Formosa, and Indochina, creating the Southeast Asia co-prosperity sphere. Meanwhile, Allied intelligence sources reported an increase in Japanese agents in Thailand, building up their resources, both in manpower and equipment, to the south of the country. By now, the Japanese armed forces were sizable, and most of the soldiers were not only well-equipped, but also experienced. Having secured bases in China and Southeast Asia, 
the island stood out as a crucial objective for the Nippon Empire's expansionist endeavor. Then, in a bewildering move, the Japanese attacked all Western powers in a simultaneous attack that spanned over 3,000 miles, including the United States, the United Kingdom, and the Netherlands. As the Japanese wrecked Pearl Harbor half a world away, another force bombed the Royal Air Force north of Singapore, smashing the puny fleet in the area and eliminating the defenders' ability to retaliate. Shrewd and well thought out, the invaders' tactics rendered the British vulnerable even before a single Japanese soldier had set foot on the island. Furious, the Royal Navy responded with a futile counterattack by deploying the battleship Prince of Wales and the battlecruiser Repulse to intercept any incoming convoys. However, both were sunk by the more powerful Japanese forces. Unable to assault from either air or sea, Singapore's only hope now lay on the British Army and the Commonwealth forces. Overconfidence The jungles of Malaya offered supposedly impenetrable protection. With treacherous mangroves and swamps, a naval attack from the south seemed much simpler. Even so, Lieutenant General Tamayuki Yamashita would lead their men the hard way. The Japanese launched a formidable offensive. Ruthless and fearless, the invaders took the inexperienced British forces completely by surprise and swept through the mainland virtually unopposed. As early as December 11th and 12th, the defending forces were humiliated at the Battle of Jitra, and the British finally understood that having overestimated the defensive nature of the tropical jungle was a grave mistake. The attacking forces raised the ground without stopping to restrain or corral enemy troops, as they would not take prisoners. The 90,000 strong defense was utterly undermined, as the relentless ground troops were supported by no less than 600 state-of-the-art fighters and bombers. Unlike the feeble defense, the Japanese had light tanks and bicycle units that outmaneuvered the British in the jungle and forced their retreat down the peninsula. By the end of January 1942, but Churchill had explicitly ordered the defenders to hold Singapore to the last man. As such, Percival instructed his men to withdraw to the Johore Strait to consolidate the British positions on the island for a final stand. Unison on paper, the defenders appeared to have a chance, especially after reinforcements from the 18th Division arrived to bulk up the garrison. Percival had put together an army of 70,000 men against 35,000 enemy warriors. In fact, Yamashita had been offered four entire divisions for the operation, but he reckoned only three would suffice. Even so, the multinational British, Canadian, Indian, and Australian forces were no match for a united enemy fueled by an all-consuming imperialistic drive. The Japanese organization and skills were far superior, while the British morale was unbearably low and desertion rates were alarmingly high. Having crossed the Causeway Bridge on the 31st, British engineers destroyed the only connection between the island and the mainland, preparing for the onslaught. But in a surprising move, the invading forces came from the north instead of the sea to the south. The huge gun emplacements that fortified the so-called impenetrable stronghold were pointing in that direction, and were completely useless to repel an attack over land. Though far superior in numbers, the defenders spread over 70 miles across the island to attempt to halt the enemy's advance, but they were thinned so much that they could not stop the invasion. Percival had anticipated that the main attack would come from the northeast, so he consolidated his defenses in that area, leaving significant gaps in the defense line to the west. When the Japanese proved him wrong on February 8th, the British were completely overwhelmed. Bluff A massive artillery barrage pummeled the 8th Australian Division in preparation for an amphibious landing that night, but the Japanese used their inferior numbers to their advantage, concentrating their forces and overwhelming the dispersed garrison. An attack from the northeast eventually happened as predicted, but it was merely a diversionary tactic that further misled the British. By the time the commander realized the main assault was coming from the west, the Japanese had already secured a beachhead on the island, and their advance became unstoppable. On February 12th, the exhausted defenders pulled back to the final defensive perimeter around Singapore City. The retreat meant the British would lose control of their own supply depot, as well as the city's water supply. Percival did not have many options. 
Despite political claims that demanded the island's defense against any military logic, the lieutenant general decided to surrender and avoid more casualties. However, the Japanese army was also beginning to struggle with supplies and was running out of ammunition. It was all or nothing, but the British ignored this crucial fact. On the 15th, the invaders insisted that Percival approach in person and march under a white flag to the old Ford Motor Factory in Burkitt Tima to negotiate the surrender. Singapore had fallen to the tenacity of the implacable Japanese, prompting Churchill to describe the event as, quote, the worst disaster and largest capitulation in British history. New Regime Within 70 days of the first landings in North Malaya, Yamashita's forces had seized the entire peninsula and achieved a military and political victory that smashed British morale and also tarnished their image around the world. The British authorities in the Far East would not be able to command the same respect as in the golden days of the empire. Moreover, they had also lost precious territories rich in minerals and natural resources that were irreplaceable for the war effort. And while it is widely assumed that Singapore was lost because the Japanese assault was unexpected, the evidence points to the fact that the attack was expected, both in location and time. Many experts believe the failure of the British and Commonwealth forces was not due to surprise or unpreparedness as much as to mismanagement and neglect. All three services on station at the island lacked the necessary equipment, while untrained new recruits were presumptuously called infantry. As a result, about 100,000 people were taken prisoner in Singapore, with several thousand forced to build the Burma-Thailand Railway, and many more losing their lives at the hands of the new regime. But for all their audacity in fighting methods, the Japanese's impressive strategic planning was not used in the post-campaign. Their administration of the occupied territories cost thousands of lives, with prisoners of war and civilians subjected to three years of torment under Japanese oppression. After the fall of Singapore, the idea of European superiority at war was shattered, and even Australia began relying more on the Americans than the British. Indeed, the Japanese seemed to have forgotten that after invading came defending and ruling the land, and their reign in the new perimeter in the Pacific was pitiful. Moreover, they would soon have to face the wrath of the giant they had aroused. Thank you for watching our video. If you enjoyed it, please give us a like. And don't hesitate to subscribe to Dark Docs for more historical anecdotes about the world wars and much more. Also, check out the rest of our Dark Documentaries channels where we publish new content regularly. And stay tuned for more.